and welcome. This month's project will teach you how to paint in black and white and in color. It won't be every color. I'm limiting it to three colors. Uh, that way I can teach you a little bit about color mixing, but not too much. And so here it is. This is what we're going to be doing. And what I would like to encourage you is if you've had friends that are like, you seem to really enjoy that library art program, but that seems way too hard for me. This might be a project for them because this one is not as difficult as some of the ones we've done in the past. The drawing is a bit easier. I've simplified that for us. And we're still gonna to touch on some important facts that you'll need to know when you're doing your artwork. Uh, so you'll learn something new and you'll get to have a new experience in color. All right, let's get started. So what we have here is a still life. And this is not just any ordinary still life. Three parts of the still life is pretty fabricated. The only real item that I have is an onion. And so I was playing around with my onion and I put it in a bud vase and I was like, that is cool. I wanna teach them about vases and also about this onion. And so when doing a still life, if you didn't set it up in front of a table or even if you did, some important things that we need to know about a still life is, you know that things can be taller. Some things can be shorter, but the important fact is that the bottoms are still planted firmly on the table and they can't really go underneath of a hard surface. They just rest there. So although things can be taller, they really can't be in a space that they don't occupy. So when you're drawing a picture of items sitting on a table, the things lower down are closer. And the bot, you have to look at the bottoms and the bottoms of things higher up are farther away. All right, so I could make a really short thing and put it way up here and it would be farther away because the bottom of it is near the top of your picture. I could make something super tall and put it way down here and it would be closer to us even though it's taller. So that's just a very important tip. So now that I've got that said, here is our eight by 10 piece of paper. And I have marked the corners of my eight by 10 paper all the way to the edges for measurement's sake. Uh, so that when you measure, you know you're going all the way to the corners. So I'm not sure if you will exactly need to know that today because uh, for the most part, everything is gonna fit on our picture today. I wanted to have three vases uh, because that's more fun with color. And also odd numbers are pretty important. Now I know when you do three and one that equals four, but this one stays separate because it's like Sesame Street says, one of these things is not like the other. Uh, that gets to be one by itself and then three in the grouping. Um, so I wanted to design some vases that would fit in this space. And I actually have one going off the space so that it could be quite wide and look attractive in our space. So I've created for myself some square placeholders or rectangle placeholders. So you can see here that I have a four by six square, a three by eight square, and a five by five square. These are how I made my plan to design what would fit on this space. And so the bottom of this square is gonna come right down to the front. The next closest one is going to be my super tall square and I'm going to have it so tall that you don't see the top really and so the bottom is next. In order for it to make sense, I didn't really want this to overlap this. It could have, but I thought it will just make a bit easier if it didn't overlap because technically they could sort of occupy the same space horizontally back there, but to create interesting negative space, I'm still going to move it up a bit as I go up here. All right, so those are my placeholders for my bases. 
All right, now that I've decided what size and how far up the paper I would like my vases to be, it's time to design my vases. Now here's the thing, you can copy me exactly. Sometimes that can be helpful, especially for beginners. And hopefully you're watching this video all the way through before you do the project so that there'll be no surprises for you. But if you'd like, as long as you stay within these sizes, you can do your own design work for your vases and come up with almost anything. The only rule is you need an opening large enough for an onion for this short guy down here. All right, here we go. The first step to a good vase is to fold your paper. The reason we wanna fold our paper is because symmetry is super hard and we really want our vases to be pretty much the same on both sides. Now, when I start painting, I kind of get out of the lines and get carried away, and so they won't necessarily stay symmetrical, but it's a good idea to start with symmetrical if you want. So you're gonna fold it, and I have sketched kind of the design that I want for my vase. So you can see I've got this edge for this lip, and I've made sure it's wide enough for an onion, so almost, the whole width up there. There's just like maybe an inch left. And then I like the idea of having a little handle or something going on on the side. And then I want, interestingly enough, this is called a foot. I want a nice foot on this face. So I folded it. I've kind of sketched the plan that I want for it. And now I will cut it out on those lines. Now I can open it and see if I really like it. Now, it's not fair because I worked on this in advance, so I know already that I really like it. But if you didn't, you could fold it and you could, if it's too big, you could fold it and you could cut it smaller to get a little bit different size by cutting it a little smaller. Or if you don't like it because it's too thin, you can always use another piece of scrap paper to kind of redraw the parts that bothered you. So if this part was too narrow, then you could go a little bigger and you can do a little addition to your drawing to get it back the way you want it. Okay, just an idea, but I'm pretty happy with mine. So I'm gonna keep it as it is. The next one is this tall one. So I'm gonna fold that piece of paper. Be sure to fold it in half because if you don't, it won't be symmetrical. It has to be equal on both sides to be symmetrical. And then for this one, I'm using a lot of the rectangle. So you can see I have my lip that's kind of at an angle near the edge. I'm gonna curve in for the neck of the vase and come back out for the shoulder on the vase then it's mostly gonna follow the side, and then I want more of a gentle slope in, but I want the base wide enough that it won't fall over when it stands. There, that looks quite nice. For my last one, I don't have to worry about symmetry because I'm only putting half of it on, or maybe even a third of it on. Who knows how wide this thing is? I just want to kind of peeking in from the side. So all I had to do was draw half of a vase that I like, and then I can cut this shape too, so that I have a good tracer for adding my designs to my image. There it is. Now for arranging. We know that this one's higher up and therefore farther away. So it goes on first. This one is not as high up as that one. We're gonna have it kind of nestled near the top here and on the edge. So it's over here. So it goes next. It might not stay put without some tape. I might get some tape. I'm gonna tape these in place, but I don't wanna put tape on my really good paper because it might tear off the surface and then I'll be disappointed. Instead, I'm gonna create hinges on the green tape to hold it still because the green tape will not be damaged by just more tape. So I've got that one in place and I'm gonna 
position this one about here and then I'll create a hinge on the green tape there. And lastly, I want to position my pot that will have an onion on it. And so I want it, this is like perfectly in the middle, but I want it a little off center because I think that'll be more interesting. And I'm going to go super close to the bottom so that I don't have to worry too much about down there. And then I'll put a little bit of tape to position it down there. This is exactly how I want my vases to be composed in this eight by 10 piece of paper. All right, I'm pretty pleased with that. Okay, so first off, we'll just trace the outside lines that we can see. So I hold them all down and follow with my pencil around the edge. So I'm going to go around here. Now, obviously there'll be an onion here. So don't press with all your might when you're coming down here because something is going to get erased here. All right. And when we hit this one, we have to go this way. So I'm not tracing the whole vase. I'm only tracing the negative space. Ha ha. You learned two things today. You've learned that the higher up the bottom is, the farther away it is. And the second thing you've learned is that the part that is in between the things that are setting here is called negative space. So we're using the negative space to create this picture. Negative space can be so helpful with almost every picture that you draw. It's a method of checking yourself. In the past, we've learned how to check ourselves with a grid. And this is another way to check yourself is like, does the negative space make sense or the space between things? Because if the negative space is too small, then things will get out of whack. All right, that negative space looks good. Now I am finished with this one and I am finished with this one. And then I get to leave this one in the front here to get the location around the handle and outline the full rest. Ta-da! You don't really need these, but it may be a good idea to hang on to them because when we do the painting, if you really go off the rails and you obliterate something, you can get it back by putting this on later. So if you're only a little bit off, no worries. It close enough counts for sure on this. You can tell I'm already slightly off on my handles, even though they were symmetrical at one point. Um, so we're good for the next step. And one of the things I'm gonna do is just kind of think about where some lines might be on here. And so there's probably gonna be a line for the lip there. There's probably going to be a line for the side of the bud vase there. And a bit of a curve for the loops. And now we get to draw the onion. I have zoomed right in for where that onion is going to go. And I want to be sure that I leave room for some of the green parts up there. And also keep in mind that the onion cannot really be wider than here because that's where it closes in on the onion. So it's kind of caught because it is a little bit wider and that keeps it from falling in. But most of it is submerged. So we're going to do that kind of work to get that curve of the onion in place. So that seems very good for the part of the onion that goes down inside the vase. I'm gonna go ahead and erase these lines here because I know they're in my way and it will make it simpler to be able to draw it. Everything is erased and now I'm ready to finish drawing my onion. First off, out here, we have kind of the papery covering of an onion, and it's starting to unwrap. And it really just looks like a wrapper at this point, how it kind of comes around everything and is loosening. And 
I really think this is super interesting. So that's the red wrapper. Next, we need the tendrils of the leafy green parts that are growing up out of this onion. And let's see, we'll have it kind of coming this way. And they're kind of bending a little bit. So this one's going to come out and then bend back to be close to where it comes out. And then we've got some overlapping of a third stem that's pretty much just behind it. And there may be even more stems behind it, but these are the only ones that we can really see from this angle. And so that's a very simple drawing of an onion. Tell all your friends this is a good lesson to jump in on, uh, but it'll still be fun. All right, ready for the next step. The next step is to outline all your pencil lines with black acrylic paint. So just a little squirrel do ya. And if you have a lot of messy pencil lines, it's probably a good idea to erase things that might confuse you now before you paint. Uh, but everything here looks like I'm ready to go. And because I'm right-handed, I'm gonna start at the top left so that I can rest my hand while I'm outlining. If you are left-handed, then you will probably want to start on the top right. Also, this picture is small, so when you're going in different directions, go ahead and spin your picture to make it easier for you to outline. Uh, one of the things to keep in mind when you outline, don't have too much paint on your brush, but also make sure that you're pulling the brush in the direction that the handle of the brush is going. So you can see how I'm adjusting the paper and my hand so that I am pulling the bristles instead of pushing them. So here I am getting this all in place. And you'll notice that my fingers are doing some of it, but a lot more is happening from my shoulder. There's a bit more fine tuning that you will get from using your shoulder. It is a ball and socket joint uh, instead of the hinge joint that is your fingers. So if you can move your whole arm and hand you will have a little bit easier time of getting a variety of marks from your brush. Now that everything is outlined, I have added a little white paint to my plate and it's going to be time to think about form. So we're going to think about form without being concerned about the color at this point. Um, so we only have to think about black and white and shades of gray right now. And we're going to create form to our vases so that we can integrate color a little bit later. So basically we're going to make it not look like a coloring book and more look like something else. So we have black paint and we have white paint. And so we're gonna get a little black on our brush. We're gonna get a little white on our brush. And we don't know if this is gonna to be too light or too dark. Oh, how can we tell? My guess is it's gonna be more dark than light because the brush has just been busy with only black on it for all this time. So it's gas tank is a little bit fuller with the dark color. So I'm gonna start over here and kind of get rid of some of the dark color in this space. And don't be scared if it gets too dark. You know I will show you how to get out of a situation like that, right? All right, so I've kind of rubbed off all the paint on there and now I get to pick up some white. And look how I, I can just put the white right on top of it. And we're kind of creating that shadow form right there. And I've chosen these two parts because these feel like the darkest places on this particular vase. So I'll show you how that looks. So basically the light is gonna be shining from this direction, so it'll be hitting there. So the darker areas will be over here. 
Now the next thing is this vase is probably going to be casting a shadow there. So let's pick up some black and some white and let's do copycat of this design on this side. The time consuming part of this project is going to be mostly because um, I've given you a very small brush. The small brush is because you're a beginner and you feel like you have more control and you do have more control. However, it's a little bit like being on the bunny hill, hill in your skis. You're not going to get to go down that hill very fast. Um, you're going slow because this brush is just not able to get a lot of paint on the paper at one time. And so the more confident you are, you might want to consider buying yourself a little larger brush if you're more advanced. Um, but for beginners, the small brush makes us breathe a sigh of relief that we don't lose the control we hope to have. All right, so I've got kind of the dark shadowy places on that base in place. And now I'm not gonna go in the black anymore. I'm just gonna kind of play in this light color, kind of merge and get some interesting color on the base. All right, so I've got puddles of gray, puddles of dark gray, and those places are found. And now I wanna to try to blend those together. So I'm gonna kind of create an edge that follows this shape. And I'll have to play in the black again to keep it true to this gray I wanted. Got a curve for a bulge here. All right, that looks pretty good. Now I'm gonna create the brightest edge right on the lip and a reflection of light right on this shoulder. All right, you are welcome to spend more time on that. I know that the color is going to conceal some of that form. So we mostly just wanted to create some form there. And so I'm ready to move on to the next space. All right, let's move on to this one because I'm right-handed um, and here I go. So I want the darkest areas to be kind of under this lip because the light can't get down there and I want the darkest areas to be on this side and under the bulge. So I notice I'm not washing my brush between colors. Then my brush gets soggy and I got to deal with that. And there's just no point because it's easier to just kind of keep it wet. Acrylic paint works the best when it's wet, which is kind of funny because it dries so fast that it's almost never wet. Um, so once you develop good confidence in acrylic paint, you will find that you're better at it um, because it plays well in itself and it gets a little hard when it's dry to get the results that you want. So we will get that back on there. I'm gonna put a little black here now. All right, so I'm gonna keep this kind of C motion and then gradually it'll get straight up and down. So think about, this one is mostly spherical. Think about your globe from grade school and how it has those latitude lines going up and down north and south on that globe. And so those are the kind of marks that you'll make if you're looking at it, because this is kind of the prime meridian and then these are all gonna curve that way and then these are gonna curve this way. So if you do strokes like that, it gives your vase form and helps with shading. So shading is only to give something form so that it feels solid and has depth and isn't just flat like flat Stanley. So we, we don't want flat Stanley visiting our still life today. All right, and I'm gonna go a little darker again. This is already dried. I do have the AC on, so um, of course it's 90 degrees today, so 
Uh, but anyway, that will cause things to dry out a little faster if you have a fan or something blowing on you, which I hope you do if it is this hot. Get that neck up there and get some highlights on the space of that neck. Get a little handle and the lip. You'll hear me refer to parts of vases and you'll notice that they, they have body parts. Um, so this is the lip of the vase. They have a foot, they have shoulders. Kind of interesting actually. All right. I'm pretty happy with that. And now I'm gonna get the highlights on. So we need the brightest part on this side. If it's too wet for the highlights, you can come back. I think I'll come back because it feels a little too wet. And I'm gonna use the gray on my brush to get our onion. So the onion is a little smaller space and we mostly just need this light gray on here for now. So I'm just continuing to put my brush in the white and if there's a little black in it at this point I'm not going to worry about freshening it up so that I can end up with some kind of gray. Now our onion also has kind of that globe kind of feel, striations kind of like latitude lines this way that way and then we're going to fill in. and the green parts. So mostly I'm just getting the gray on there. So think back to our pencil project where we just kind of grayed everything and then we erased out the light part and added the dark shadows. I'm gonna take that similar approach and I'm gonna hang on to my lines. Ha, negative space. I almost painted that like a leaf. If I did, I just would paint over it with background color. All right, so I got that and I'm gonna Get a little bit of the darkness to put a shadow side on the green. Shadow side, shadow side, shadow side. I'm gonna shadow side on these folds and kind of a shadow side over here. I imagine in there would be the shadow. That might be sticking out a bit. All right. And now it would be good to have a paper towel, but I have plenty of room on my plate. So I'm just gonna kind of clear off some loaded paint on my brush so that I can scoop up just white and now I will put white here, here, a little part on this little sticky outy part, and quite a lot on this part. And on this side of my onion. All right, last base, tall base. Again, light's coming from here, so we'll get the darker side on first. So under the lip, bit of a sideways tornado shape for the shadow part here. Just have a gray side kind of coming down. Now I don't need a shadow cast from here to here because the light's going that way, so nothing will be there. Um, but this bulge could create a bit of a shadow coming down through it if it's an up and to the left kind of thing. So we'll add a little shadow part down there. Okay, and right now we're not really worried about what color things are. We're just finding form. Okay, 
Now I get to put gray everywhere else. And again, I don't have to mix it on my plate. I've got enough black on my brush to make it happen. So I'm just filling it in. With the gray. And this is a tall vase, so if I go up and down, I'll be true to its form. While it's still wet, I'm kind of blending those together. If I wait till it's dry, it's a little harder to get it to blend. So it's much easier while it's still wet. Um, and so if you're a little generous with your color, you'll find that it'll stay wet a little longer for those kinds of blending mo moments. And finally, we'll get some gray on this lip. And under the lip. All right, we got all the gray on there. Now we'll take a bit of light and kind of get our highlight. Highlight. All right. That is all the form that we need. And I ran out of my little squirt of white paint, so I'm just going to re squirt some white paint. I don't really need any more black. I probably gave myself too much black, um, but I'm going to need some more white. So I'm going to go ahead and squirt some more white because I'm going to use what I got on my brush here to kind of create a little shadow action on the table. Oh, shadow, 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 shadow. And then I'm just going to use the straight up white to paint the rest of the background so that there's something on that paper. This paper is not gessoed, so the acrylic paint can serve as gesso, and white is a good choice to kind of like get those lines like re edged here. See, so yeah, I kind of went around that corner. Um, and it keeps the paper from being too thirsty and sucking up all your colors because you have more white and black. And any good artist always has plenty of bottles of white paint on hand because that's the one that we use the most of. Um, so we're more likely to buy more white and have it on hand. So that keeps the paper from being thirsty when we get our colors on there. If a little gray shows up when you're painting your background white, that's interesting. Remember, my enemy is boring. So go ahead and keep that when that happens. Let's see if I can get some to come off. Now my brush has pretty much decided it's only painting white right now. But if it happens, don't be concerned. Nothing bad will come of that, only good to have some. If it gets like super dark and you're like, oh my goodness, it's like I killed a fly on my art right there, then you can wait till it dries and paint over it a little bit. Um, but I'm doubtful that you'll ever have that much, but you'll have to do that. I just like to tell you how to resolve it if it happens. Now I've got paint everywhere and I'm ready for color. The colors that we will be using are, this is called primary yellow from Blick, primary blue from Blick, and this one is called fluorescent violet from Blick. Um, these are going to be the ones we use for this picture. Don't feel like that all your pictures have to be made from these three colors. Uh, these are just the ones chosen because they're the easiest ones to mix for this project. So we have them on our plate. We're ready to go. And <clears throat> I do encourage you to put them on, to put them on your plate because you can mix them here on your plate if you need to. Um, the first thing we're going to do is my painting is still wet from painting them and 
I know that I want kind of a light yellow background, so I'm going to go ahead, while my paint is wet, nothing bad will come of it, and get this yellow in the background. And you might even see me adding some white to it later to make it even lighter than this. But right now I'm just going to straight up put this on here because there's not much black to get in it and it will be good to get that background color in. Okay, those are all the places for yellow and we just paint them right on top of that background, whether it was dry or not, it all worked out. Everything is yellow. Now, ordinarily, I really like to do yellow first because it's one of the lighter colors and so it is hard to cover things. And in this lesson, we're gonna start with yellow first and because it is a lighter color. The other thing about this project is we will be layering colors. So you already know that we're gonna put color on top of our black and white. That's why we did the black and white first. But we're also gonna put color on top of color. So we're gonna use this yellow to put in several places now that you'll be surprised because they don't actually look like yellow on here. So for instance, green is made out of yellow. And surprisingly enough, this onion color is made out of the yellow. So we're gonna put yellow in those places next. Okay, all those places I painted yellow, I kind of followed the strokes that I did in the gray with the brush, so I matched the strokes. And it may look like too many things are yellow, but really, this is good. And you'll notice that you can't see a lot of the detail work that you did when you created form, but that they still have a form to them and it was good practice for you. At this point, just to keep it simple, uh, we will wash our brush and we will go ahead and paint this one with the primary blue. All right, now let's watch our brush and we'll make this one the fluorescent violet. Okay, now we have color everywhere. Not necessarily the right color just yet, but we have the right color for now. We have color everywhere. So at this point, we're going to move on to where we have color combinations. Um, and you notice when you do this, your brush strokes do still show. Uh, so again, I copied my latitude lines on here. Um, don't get too caught up because we are making a painting and that kind of creates an interesting effect on this painting. And so now I have this purpley color on my brush. And I want to do this papery part of the onion. And so I'm just gonna drag a little bit of this purple color over and I'm gonna drag quite a lot of this yellow color over. And I'm gonna mix it right here and notice it makes kind of a reddish orange color. That's just what we need. And you can kind of play around with it and you could be like, okay, this is what it looks like with more purple over here. And this is what it looks like with more yellow over here and kind of find the color that you like. I kind of like the one that has like more purple to it. So I'm gonna go more to this side and kind of like a street sweeper, kind of going in circles, picking up some of that purple in there. And then I'm gonna put that on my yellow onion to get it to be more of a orangish onion. So I'm gonna get that in the spaces and I'm gonna be careful not to get it necessarily on the green part. So I gotta not lose track of where I'm headed. All right, so that is pretty orange there. And I've 
one after stirring one scoopful pretty much got the entire onion with a nice glaze of that color and while it's still wet I'd like to see a bit more of this kind of bright purple color showing up now on the surface. So it's pretty thick. If you didn't have enough of your brush to make it pretty thick, you can add a little more so that it's thick enough so you can really play in the wet paint. Then I'm going to scoop up the purpley color straight out and kind of blend that into the striations so that you get that kind of nice red onion kind of look to it. So we don't want just one color. That would be kind of boring. And so this gets to have the orange and purple and then the purple striation also right on there. So that makes me pretty happy the way that looks. All right, next I'm going to wash my brush. The brush is clean and you'll notice the position that I put the color. So I've got like the purple, yellow, blue, in a triangle kind of shape, because now I'm gonna work on my greens. <clears throat> so I'm gonna scrape over some yellow, scrape over a little blue. Now I'm only gonna use a little blue at a time because I know blue is way more powerful than green. So I'm gonna do that. And then I'm gonna start laying this color in on top of my yellow base. So notice it's kind of a light green color at this point. And yes, I know we painted it yellow first. I think that looks better to have yellow peeking through. Um, so while I was painting the purple part, my yellow part was drying for me. And I can get this all on here. Okay, I have all of that light green on there. And because I think it is easier to go darker than it is to go lighter, it probably makes sense that while I'm in this middle green to go ahead and go the lighter direction first on the vase. So I didn't wash my brush, but I'm gonna pick up some of this yellow now to make the right hand side of my vase lighter and perhaps the top. So I'm just gonna layer it right on top of that light green and find this glowier, brighter side with the yellow now. So I'm getting that on there. It's okay if it's still wet and it's okay if it's still dry, but your approach will be slightly different depending on how wet or how dry it is. Um, you'll have to go thicker with it if it's wet to get it to show up because it will mix more and you'll need to go thinner with it if it's dry and kind of build up gradually so it doesn't get out of hand like too much. All right, so I'm pretty happy with that. And now I can go towards the more dark side. So um, this was the middle color. I'm just gonna scoop up some blue and notice a lot of my mixing is happening on my project. So I had some yellow on my brush from that bright side. And now when I put the blue on my brush, I get to make this form with the blue to have that kind of blue green appearance. And I'll drag that edge over and this is super fun to do this. If it gets too dark, you can back up a little bit. You can even wipe it off a little bit if you get it too blue. But I would say just be slightly cautious over here when you put the blue on, and that's probably just the best approach. Blue line, blue line. For that shadowy side. I'm going to add it down here. And remember when we did our form, when we were doing it in the black and white, we made the decision to create a more darker edge past this bump here. And the most blue, right down at the bottom. All right, that one is all done. Well. Let's try a little more. Let's see what happens if we push it a little more. We'll be brave. Push it a little farther over. Especially because blue is my favorite color. I was going to be done, but now I'll put even more blue over there. Oh, yeah. See? Nothing bad came of it.
remember we have the green parts on the onion and I think I will use the middle color again. So I've got my blue on my brush. I'm going to drag over some yellow and we will get the green stems on this onion. I'm going to stick with the light green first. Since it's good to go from light to dark. And then I'm going to pick up the blue to make that darker green on each one. Just like that. And we'll let the little orange parts cast a shadow. All right, and I'm keeping it loose and painterly because we are making a painting, I'm not making a photocopy at Kinko's. I don't think Kinko's even exists anymore. At any rate, we're making a painting. Okay, so we had this part all fluorescent violet. And so now is a really great time to mix these two colors together. Um, so we have some of the violet, we're gonna mix some of the blue and Look at that lovely purple that we get. And so I wanted you to be able to see that you don't have to stick with just the one color. And so I'm gonna use this color to put in the shadow on this face. And we can kind of see the shadow peeking through from where we created form in the black and white. And so we'll just kind of copy that curve and put that in there. Now this, this works because there's no white in these colors. If you mix white in these colors, this isn't gonna work out so nice for you. So I, I encourage you not to mix white in them at this point while you're learning how to do the layering effect um, because you will have more success um, with the appearance of the color kind of shining through. I pick up a little of this color now and kind of do it intermediate in between. Something else would happen if there was white in all of them. Um, so this lesson is not about that. So I'm just letting you know it's not the only way to do something. This is just a way to do something. I'm going to mix this a little bit more purpley and I'm going to use this color now to get some shadows in. So remember we talked about a shadow kind of here. Notice how the purple on the yellow really grays. So we're imagining a shadow cast from the green one and the red one. No shadows necessary over here. We could put a little bit like right on the line. Right, and I think it will just be more fun if we put a little bit more of this pinky color in here. We'll do some reflected light there. Because you know, I'm all about fun. Yeah, I like that. Okay, we've got all the colors. We've got the color mixing. We've got the layering. And so now we're going to redefine our artwork. So we're going to go back to black and white. So at this point, clean off your brush and dry your brush. And we're going to start with the black color first. I'm able to do this lesson all in one setting without taking any breaks. And so my black is still moist enough. I don't need to like reload. Um, and I'm not necessarily going to carefully, carefully get every line to be exactly exact. At this point, I want my lines to be painterly. So I'm just going to make sure there's enough paint on my brush and kind of loosely Follow those edges, maybe create a new edge. And so this is when things kind of change up a bit. So it's not going to be so precise. You can see I've got my brush more handle angled up so that the tip of my brush is kind of dancing along the painted surface. And I'm only going to get kind of like the, the lines that really give it form. So it doesn't necessarily have 
all the lines copied on this one. So kind of we want it to be interesting. New lines might occur. I won't be outlining any shadows. You want those to have soft edges, so I'm not going to go around this. All right, and yep, that's defined enough. Okay. Next, I will clean off my brush because the last color is white. So they're well defined and we get to use, I have quite a lot of white on my brush because I wanted to really be able to stand up on this surface and be loose. And have that kind of highlighty edge. Imagine bright light kind of shining down. If you get black on your brush like that, kind of Wipe it off on a napkin or on a corner of your plate. And we're putting highlights everywhere because when we glazed the other colors over top, uh, it made a super light color, but it couldn't be entirely white anymore because the new color is now on it. So this becomes important to get those interesting edges of light. Okay, and then the last place that I wanna put white is I'm actually gonna put some fresh white right on top of this yellow in some places. I think I mentioned, mentioned that earlier when I was painting the yellow there. I'm just gonna calm it down and create a new kind of yellow by painting white on top. And so though down here at the bottom, I went with horizontal and up here on the wall, I'm going to go with vertical. This works because white is opaque. And I'm going to leave a little bit of that yellow kind of glowing around edges. Right, and that is the end of that project. Last but not least, you can either sign it with paint or you can take your tape off and sign it with a pen on the white part that's left over. So we'll sign it, take our tape off, or take our tape off and then sign it. You decide. 2021. That was very fun. At least I had fun and I hope you did too. And I hope to see you at one of our Arlington Heights Library meetups. Bye, thanks.